All right, welcome to part two. This is my series looking at Carl Bau's creation in the 21st century. This episode is called Preponderance of Evidence and stars John Hefner, a mathematician. Uh, we left off, he was talking about uh, enzymes and their importance in the cell. I've been asked to believe that originally there was a primordial soup, an ocean of soup of chemicals that just give it enough time and it will assemble a cell and that has metabolism and reacts to stimuli and can reproduce and has a membrane with pumps in it and all those kinds of things. That's quite a leap of faith that the yes. evolutionists must exercise. And A leap of faith that evolutionists must exercise? It would appear to me that the good professor is getting his biochemistry knowledge from mystical forest. Uh, because otherwise I don't understand where he would get the idea that any evolutionist, uh, biochemist, uh, whatever, ever said that some primordial soup spontaneously generated a modern cell complete with membrane pumps and uh, and all of its protein machinery in place. Uh, that is a straw man and a bunch of bullshit. If it doesn't speed up, have something that speeds it up right from the beginning, it's not ever going to happen. Now, speeds what up exactly? Now, he, he states this repeatedly in this, this portion of it. I just used one clip of it. Um, he said it earlier, of course, that enzymes speed up reactions, and that's true. But he doesn't say what, speci what specific reactions he's talking about here. What, what reactions have to happen quickly or don't happen at all? Uh, I, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think he doesn't understand his material. Uh, as we go on, uh, you, you'll see what I'm talking about. For one thing, uh, only left-handed amino acids are in living protein, right? And they form equally left-handed and right-handed if you try to do it on your own. Now, the jury needs to know this. Mm -hmm. When they form, uh, even in the body of material that's there, that's been designed, when they form, mm -hmm. they form equal amounts of left and right-handedness. Well, if we try to artificially form them, yes. that's true. All right, the point he's making here is one of those kind of nonsensical points that you see a lot in this uh, creationist stuff, uh, where essentially he's presenting a relatively accurate biological fact and then just making the claim that this is somehow a problem for evolution or a problem for abiogenesis. Uh, when in fact it's actually not. Uh, first of all, the, the, yes, it's true. Um, amino acids are, are, are isomers, meaning that they can come in left-handed, right-handed forms. That, that's tr absolutely true. And that our proteins are primarily composed of the left-handed isomer. So, uh, so the right-handed ones that occur in nature, that are produced abiotically, right and left are produced, seem to be produced in relatively equal amounts, and are, we only can utilize the left-handed isomers. The right-handed isomers are useless to us. Uh, people have hypothesized that had life began using the right-handed ones, we'd be using right-handed proteins and rejecting the left-handed ones, if that makes sense, our amino acids to build proteins. Um, left -hand, our right-handed amino acids could form the identical, identical proteins to the ones that we use. They would just be in the opposite conformation. Um, but that's just not the way it happens. Uh, oddly enough, sugars we use right. We only use right-handed isomers of sugars, which is kind of it's because they also have isomers. Um, so he's presenting a relatively interesting fact, and there's been a lot of speculation about it. Some, some there's actually a lot of ideas um, that show that, given sort of equal starting points, that left-handed tend to dominate. Anyways, we're looking at um, naturally occurring amino acids, and there seems to be a strong bias towards left-handed ones. So that that may be the reason behind it. So it's an interesting idea, not a problem for evolution whatsoever, and it's been addressed abundantly in, in a lot of abio a sources on abiogenesis. But what I thought was funny about this is that you see um, Bao kind of jumps in there, you know, trying to sound highly intelligent, going, you know, only the right, only the left-handed ones are used, even when it's produced in your body. And Hefter kind of says, "Well, no. When when we produce them, not in your, you know, why would your body produce um, right-handed amino acids if it can't use them? Right? Your body's producing left-handed amino acids, the left-handed isomers of the ones that your body can produce. They're, your body's not producing equal amounts of both, and then only using one half of them. That would be ho horribly wasteful, and that's not the way it works. But it was funny that Hefter kind of caught it, and then um, Bao didn't even say, "Oh, I was wrong." He just was like, "Yes," you know, agrees with him, which is very funny. Um, anyway, and uh, but living 
uh, proteins consist only of left-handed amino acids. Yes. Right-handed spiral in the wrong direction and they won't merge with the molecule properly. And uh, so if you don't speed it up, they will degrade, even if it's all left-handed ordered from a lab, it will degrade to an equal mix, essentially a 50-50 right-handed, left-handed. It won't work in living And it systems. won't work. And so again, it's another example of uh, you know this irreducible complexity. Okay, this now, this is again I had said earlier. I don't know that he really quite understands all of this, and he kind of this shows it right here. So he's talking about um, the fact that if you have amino acids, um, even if you have an absolutely you know a, a sample of all left-handed amino acids that. You have to, and to f- form those into a protein, but if you don't form them into a protein, um, they they can break down and they can actually flip and become the opposite isomer. Um, this is called racemization. So this does happen. This actually will happen when, especially in well, it actually only happens pretty much in non-living things. Uh, so what he's stating here is is that if you've got the building block blocks for a protein and you don't put that protein together fast enough. Uh, some of those amino acids could flip, thereby making them useless for the protein. It's like, well, that's a really interesting point, right? But you got to ask yourself, how long does that take? How long, you know, are we talking like hours? I mean, so, you know, unless you have these catalysts in place ready to turn that amino acid into a protein, it's going to flip on you? Or are we talking, you know, what's the time frame? Well, it turns out it's centuries, if not thousands of years, for the ones that we know that can flip. Not all of them can. Not all of them do. The ones we know that do take thousands of years to do so. So they, they, it, there's ones that happen faster than that as well. But not, not, it's not like your body's rushing to hurry up and let's get these amino acids converted quickly before they flip. It's not happening that fast. Um, so essentially, yeah, he's right. You know, this animal that laid around for a couple of thousand years, you know, and didn't have those those enzymes working, just might find a whole bunch of its amino acids have turned. Um, so therefore, 50% of its amino acids aren't functioning anymore. But if it's laying around for a thousand years, it's probably not alive and probably doesn't need those proteins in the first place. So what he's saying here is kind of nonsensical. It really is. Non- for a living thing within the normal lifespan of a living organism, this racemization process is completely and totally meaningless. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Now, enzymes are, are small, specialized proteins that fold into a certain shape that scientists have likened as a key into a lock. Isn't that nice? Folding just right Mm -hmm. in the perfect configuration. And it's not a master key, they're specific keys. So that specific enzyme has to have the information, the data, to do that specific job, whatever it is, in the cell. And the more we uncover these things and find out about them, the more it's mind-boggling. It sounds like there was not only a designer but an all-knowing designer who knew the end from the beginning. Oh, absolutely. It's true. Some enzymes are so specific to their substrate that it's almost miraculous looking how well they fit precisely, exactly, not just on a substrate, but in a specific region or a specific portion of the substrate which they um, upon which they're, they're going to do their enzymatic action. But, yeah, and that's, that, again, that's true of most enzymes. But... We live in a beautiful world with infinite diversity and infinite combination, um, and it turns out that not all enzymes are that specific. Not all enzymes are that well designed. Um, some enzymes are really crappy at what they do. Um, they function, they work, uh, they do what they're supposed to do. But we see in other species they do it better. We have enzymes that aren't as efficient as the enzymes in other species that serve the same function. They're independently evolved. They serve a similar function. Their enzymes do it better than ours. Other things, whole taxa, mammals do it better than reptile or de- than birds do, or birds do better than mammals, or whatever we happen to see. We see this variation. We see a lot of enzymes that are, let's say they, they are designed, I'm using the term in, not in the ID sense, um, but they, they're optimized to attach to a certain combination, a certain type of combination molecule. And so they will work for any molecule with that, you know, so they work with a wide variety of things. So they, they serve multiple functions, none of those functions very well. There's a trend 
for enzymes to specialize and to, be, to becoming better and better and better at a very specific thing. So this is why we see in most things the enzymes are lo, do look so well designed. Um, and again, what's the wonderful thing about evolution, about biology, is that it's sloppy and it's lazy, and it tends to, rather than start with the most efficient system, it tends to just sort of use spare parts and things that are laying around. Uh, so when we see an enzyme, we have a we have this big globby protein molecule and this enzymatic this this key function as he designed it, this precise key stuck to one end of it, but the rest of the protein is a non functional version of another protein the body uses. This whole big globby end on it does absolutely nothing could be carved off if the system was efficient but it's still there why is it still there because that's just the way the, the way it's encoded to function um if that makes sense um this is why we look at the wasted bits in evolution don't look at things that work right don't look at the things that are efficient look at the inefficiencies look that's where the story lies that's where we see oh, okay so this enzyme evolved from this kind of protein and we can tell that because, again, it has this non-functional section of protein sort of hanging on, um, that, that, if that's a, a way to describe this. And uh, so if these enzymes were not there at the beginning, the hypothetical first cell would have never actually formed. And so, again, it points to a designer. Design right. always points to a designer. Yes. But where do enzymes come from? They come from enzymes. <laughs> oh, is that nice? And how do they know what to do? The DNA told me to do it. See, the DNA is coded information, and we always have uh, confidence that instructions always are traceable to a mind of some kind. Yes, and it all must be in place simultaneously, exactly. or it's not there at all. And I okay, uh, so it's designed because it takes enzymes to make enzymes, so therefore you have to have a designer to start it off. Like, first of all... Uh, RNA, some RNA can make enzymes, um, can make proteins. So RNA can act as enzyme. There, there are RNAs that can behave like the enzymes that are used to make proteins, including other enzymes. All right, uh, they're called ribozymes, and in fact, we all use them. They're part of part of our protein making process. We still utilize ribozymes, and it's believed belief. Um, hypothesized that in early life, RNA solely served this function. RNA, act, RNA can act like proteins, it can act like enzymes, and it can transfer and carry information. It can carry this template. Um, so before DNA, before proteins, it's proposed that RNA kind of served a wide variety of functions in primitive life. Then again, as specialization occurred, RNA's functions sort of got co-opted by more DNA does it more efficiently than RNA. Um, proteins, enzymes are better than ribozymes for serving the same functions, these kinds of things. So um, again, stepwise evolution, it works. I'm sure the, the audience gets the point here. And even if we knew nothing of God, we could infer from this preponderance of evidence in one field of science that he is there, he's very wise, he's all-knowing, he's capable, he's loving, he's he has provided for his creation and all those other facets of God and what a Point great God we well have. well taken. I call bullshit. Uh, with, if we did not start off with an already existing God concept, we would not, by studying biochemistry, infer a God concept. Okay, It's simply not the case. How do we infer that God is loving from biochemistry? How do we infer that God is all-knowing from biochemistry? The reality is those components and molecules and everything yes they are very very complex and yes they work amazingly well but the reality is a chemical engineer looking at it can easily see whole portions of it that are redundant whole sections that are uh, wasteful that utilize poor systems like I stated earlier with the enzymes a lot of enzymes have an active site but the rest of the molecule is clearly a broken protein from another system. It uses all of these spare parts. It conscripts systems from other portions of systems and puts it together. It looks a whole lot like natural selection, trial and error, a whole lot more than it looks like a, a planned out, designed system. So he's just outright talking out of his ass.